Who I'd like to introduce next is Judge Mitchell. Uh, Honorable Reverend Everett D. Mitchell was born and reared in Fort Worth, Texas. Mitchell accepted his call to ministry at the age of 15. Upon his, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> You don't know that word. <laughs> Matriculation <laughs> from high school, Judge Mitchell relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, where he graduated from Morehouse College with a BA in math <laughs> <laughs> mathematics and religion. While at Morehouse, Reverend Mitchell was awarded the Presidential Scholar Award in Mathematics, American Scholar Award, Mathematical Scholar, National Dean's List, Who's Who Among College Students, Benjamin May Scholar, Top Ranking Religion Senior at Morehouse College, Student Government Service Award, Golden Key Honor Society, Dean's List 1998 to 2000 in the Community Service Award. After Reverend Mitchell graduated Morehouse College, he was ordained at the age of 23. Wow. That's young. Uh -huh. Judge Mitchell was elected to the Dane County Circuit Court on April 5th, 2016. He took the bench on August 1st, 2016. He presides over Branch 4 in Dane County. Judge Mitchell's current rotation is a juvenile rotation where he where he presides over cases of family reunification, as well as young people who commit law violations. Over the 14 years that Judge Mitchell has been a member of the Dane County Community Award, or community, <laughs> he, um, well, we lost my space there. <laughs> Welcome to the future, everybody. <laughs> Zoom and everything. <laughs> but I'll start over again. He presides over Branch 4 in Dane County. Judge Mitchell's current rotation is a juvenile rotation where he presides over cases of family reunification as well as young people who commit law violations. Over the 14 years that Judge Mitchell has been a member of the Dane County community, he has become dedicated, very dedicated, a very dedicated advocate for justice for all, but especially for the underserved and disenfranchised community. He has received numerous honors for his quiet and effective efforts towards improving relationships and communication between various diverse groups. It is most definitely my honor to introduce Judge Everett Mitchell. Well, thank you all so much for having me here. I, I didn't know people were doing recordings and sitting recordings in the day. I guess I could have <clears throat> done something like that, but I like to be live and be present with uh, everyone. I will say that uh, as I was preparing my thoughts uh, for this meeting today, I was thinking about my own recovery. <clears throat> and this marks, this marks uh, 13 years, 13 years. Uh, so I'm really, you know, excited to be here with you all to celebrate, you know, my 13th year of recovery. Uh, in addition to being a Dane County Circuit Court judge, I, I also oversee our high-risk drug court. So I, I oversee our drug court here in Dane County, uh, which deal with our high-risk cases uh, related to drug court. And I'm so excited about uh, the potential that we're doing at drug court and the opportunity to support so many wonderful human beings who are trying to find uh, their path toward and stay on their path toward recovery. So what I really wanted to share with you today is, you know, uh, a little bit about the work that we're doing in the Dane County Courts. And one of the things that I think is so important uh, as we think about ways to support uh, recovery. And and and, I've, and one of the guys uh, who, uh, one of our recovery coaches brought something to my attention last week uh, during one of our sessions that I thought is so important and that I wanted to relay to you all as we begin to think about this beautiful way of hope and recovery and ensuring that all of our systems are supporting hope uh, and holding, holding fast to the idea of hope while we go uh, through all of our different processes uh, on this journey of recovery. But one of the things that I, I thought was very important is language. I think you know, recovery requires a special language uh, for us to embrace. And I can tell you right now, courts, especially courts that uh, support, uh, quote unquote, support families, it's horrible with language when it comes to substance use and, uh, and the individuals with substance use. So, you know, in our court orders, <clears throat> often we call uh, substance, you know, this is not me, but the language that is often portrayed in these orders are like, you know, people with, sub with you got your substance uh, abuse issues or substance abuse problems, your AODA problems, and I've had to really work with social workers and department people to say, let's stop calling people's problems or issues. We don't even have to deal with that. We don't have to use that language. 
but there's so much shaming language around the you know substance use that the shaming language often gets inside of the very documents that we create to support families and individuals on that process. So we're trying to get the system to get away from shaming individuals, which is pretty much the the you know the pie of how people think about individuals. You know, and maybe because I am in recovery too, so I don't want to be producing shameful language that often diminishes and dehumanizes individuals along that process. Uh, one of the things that uh, Brother Joseph from Smart Recovery and one of our recovery coaches said to me, he said, listen, we need to make sure that we stop saying stuff like clean UAs and because, you know, or get clean or get clean because that implicates that people are dirty or have been dirty. And I said, man, that is such a wonderful way to reverse language and make sure that we're not using language that takes away the humanity of individuals and restricts them from being able to see themselves through a prism of dirtiness and filth and, and embarrassment and shame. So yeah, so he brought something to my attention. He said, well, and, I, and I've thought about it, I said, maybe we shouldn't even, and then while he was talking, a participant said, yeah, that makes sense, man. I hate the way that they're always talking about having a negative UA because the negative UA suggests that there's a negative connotation to doing something clean in my UA. So we were just having this wonderful discussion about how language makes sense and how it probably does make sense to have say, whoa, man, you had a positive UA rather than trying to say you had something positive, but negative, but negative is a positive and it just confuses the standards of recovery in that process. So I told him, I said, yeah, man, that's a good way. So now I'm thinking about ways that we can support bringing in language that uh, you know maximizes the process of the way human beings hear uh, and everybody has it differently, but I do believe language is so important because in the end, humanity is what we're trying to erupt from this process and making sure that human beings understand their worth, even as they're going through this process. And as a person who's walking in constantly walks in that recovery in that space, you know, it is possible to maintain and have a life and continue to live a life and have a beautiful life uh, with family and community and children and all those things that you want to have in your life. And so we have to, you know, retain that sense of hope. But then the second thing is that I realized that recovery requires trust and accountability. Now trust is an interesting balance when you're dealing with courts because trust requires the building of relationships of trust to allow people to be heard. And this is where I think as a judge, I'm trying to work both with our service providers and our participants uh, and sometimes it don't always make sense to a lot of, maybe to a lot of people why I tolerate listening and people be, you know, you know, people think judges are, shouldn't have, shouldn't have to have cuss words uh, leveled at them. And since this is a family show, I won't tell you what some of my participants say, uh, but I will say that I, because I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, because I grew up in poverty, because I love comedy, because I love Cat Williams and Richard Pryor, I was listening to Richard Pryor before I was even going to church. So curse words never affect me like that. So I'm like, people be loud and cussing and saying all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, hmm, that's very interesting. I never thought of it like that because my ears are not trained to see, hear them as disrespect. My ears are trained to see them as a mode of communication. And individuals who may be communicating frustration and anger, they don't need us to always run around and try to be pure people who only can listen to pure words. That's not reality how people communicate. I'd rather them drop some F-bombs, some S-bombs, some A-bombs every now and then. And then we come back to the table and say, all right, so what does that mean for you? Right? I'm not going to get offended just because they drop A-bombs -A unless they cussing me out. Then we got issues. But other than that, hey, if you want to talk about how you feel, let's talk about it. But what I realized is what people value is being heard, right? Even if they know I'm going to go with a different decision than they may want at that time, they at least know that they're going to have the capacity to express themselves, be heard, and get that off their chest. And even if I go in a different direction than they want, they can, they can feel comfortable because I trust them. And then secondly, what is accountability? I don't think accountability is always putting people in jail. Locking folks up throughout the process, I don't think always is helpful. Sometimes sometimes it is a carrot because some people just get tired of just going to jail and they get tired of it. But I think a further accountability of folks in recovery is just understanding what are their goals? What do they want to do? What do they want to see? And then supporting them with those goals in mind. Simply just, you know, trying to lock them away and think that that's going to solve it doesn't, doesn't really get them to a level of accountability. But as a judge, I not only want to hold individuals 
accountable to their goals. I think it's important to hold system of partners accountable too. There are two things that happened to us in our in our Dane County courts that really made me realize, like you know, the the our participants need somebody who's going to advocate and fight for their wholeness as well. One, we had an issue where one of my participants needed to go on a, a, a you know, sanction for the Department of Corrections and he was going to be in jail, but the jail refused to give him his medication. He had a, he had a proper script. They know he needed his medication, but they kept saying to me, well, we don't, we, you know, we got a telehealth person and a telehealth person needs to contact with this person and, and that person needs to get that. And I'm sitting like, well, that ain't my problem. That's not my damn problem. My problem is, is that I have somebody I'm responsible for and you telling me that in a space where I got nine different hospitals, I got pharmacies everywhere, you can't get my man his medication because he has dual diagnosis and he needs his medication. I had to use the power of the judge to subpoena these people that I'm supposed to work with to bring them in to get some answers. So eventually this year, this man could get his medication, get stable and be back out in the community and begin to work on some goals for himself. And then secondly, we just, uh, it was just brought to my attention that when uh, individuals are brought into the jail, whether it is through a sanction or a hold by the PL, that the jail doesn't provide them suboxone so they can be able to maintain their suboxone treatment while they're inside of the jails. I thought that was just one of the most uh, inhumane policies I have ever heard of. That somebody who may need those suboxones to maintain it and if they start to tailor off for two, three days, they're gonna be going through massive withdrawal. It's just un it's unfathomable to me. So I committed to my, you know, to my participants that that's something I will work on and ensure that if we're going to be using that as a part of our modality, then we need to ensure that we're not putting people in a worse situation uh, later on. And then lastly, it's about individualized versus a systemic vision, right? I think recovery should be treated as individuals, right? We should not treat people as though, you know, one cookie cutter fits the whole mold and everybody should fit into that mold. We have to remember that, you know, recovery is an individual process. And some of us have moved through all kinds of trauma. Some of us have moved through, you know, our own mental, uh, mental well-being that we've had to embrace and, and become whole in that mental process. You know, some people, for whatever reasons, use different, uh, different vices for different things. But it has to be tailored or individualized and make sure everybody is treated as an individual. I just think the biggest individual thing that people lose focus of is the idea that in recovery, everybody is learning to deal with grief differently because if you've been through recovery, you've had to, you've lost something, right? You have lost, there's none of us, and maybe I'm just by myself or the few people I've hung with in recovery, all of us have lost something, right? You lose time with your children, you lose time with your family, jobs, relationships you care for, where at the, at the, at the apex, you know, of your process, you know, there are a lot of things that you lose. And so there's a lot of grief that comes along with, uh, you know, this recovery healing process and just helping individuals to feel safe to know that grieving and loss is a part of the healing dynamic, which is ultimately what makes us all connected together. Because ultimately, you know, I think recovery is like a good boomerang effect. You know, yeah, there may be an extension of things you may go out and lose, but the beautiful thing is, is that everything in life comes right back to our hearts and, and, and gives us the strength to do it again. I, you know, I can't represent, you know, the, to the other individuals in our courtroom who come and who are there that, you know, life is always fair and it's always equal. It is not. But what I can assure you is, is that if you survive one thing, you can survive this as well. And so that is the, that is the love and that is the joy that we bring. I'm no longer embarrassed to tell people that I, that I am in recovery because it is my process. It is my truth. It is my hope. I'm not ashamed of it. And if people try to use that against me, I will remind them that this is just a truth that I need to share because others in this community need to know that just because you know you have power doesn't mean you you can't be vulnerable enough to stand with many of our brothers and sisters in community who are walking through a healing process themselves. So we stand together. I stand in solidarity and support. And I'm just so glad that we have this 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 space to begin to rally and bring together great voices and to honor the process of all the love that we share toward one another. So thank you so much. And I'm glad maybe I should have my little tagline. <clears throat> so thank you.
All right, thank you so much to the Honorable Reverend Everett Mitchell. Every time I hear you speak, um, I get goosebumps. You are amazing. So thank you so much for joining us today. We, we truly do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Monte. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. All right. See you at church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm trying to, I got to, uh, I got to show up to one of your drug courts. Uh, I'll, I'll all right. Tell you, okay. Yeah, email me so I can send you the Zoom link, all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. yes. Called you out about going to church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. He, he talking about drug court. I said church. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> I, 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 need, I need the Lord in my life. I do. I do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right.